I'm Jamie. I'm one of the pastors at Calvary, and it's been uh, a rough week. And so thanks for joining us in prayer about that situation. Uh, Any time that we go through some kind of crisis or tragedy like what happened this week, uh, one of the things that we ask, I've been asking this all week, and I, I know a lot of you have, is why didn't you stop this from happening, God? You could have stopped this. Right? We, I mean, we know God is powerful enough to have stopped that. He's all-powerful. So why didn't you do that? And, and uh, really, who knows how many things like this God does stop, right? And we don't even know about it. But, um, but sometimes he doesn't. And that's um, really part of a, a bigger issue, which is God really does not rule the way we would expect him to in so many ways. And uh, we've been singing about King Jesus, and he is, he's king, king of kings. But as Wayne said, um, you know, when those people back then, when he entered Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, uh, they didn't understand what it meant that he was king, or what kind of king he actually was, or what he wanted to do. And we don't either. A lot of times, we, we, uh, we don't understand Um, And so when Jesus is not exercising his kingly authority the way that we want him to or expect him to, what do we do? What do we do? That's an important question. That's kind of the question of this Palm Sunday. Uh, And it's the question we're going to be looking at and wrestling with in Matthew 21. So you can turn to Matthew 21. This is uh, an account of that first Palm Sunday. Um, Let's begin... Uh, with a Batman reference, because it's Palm Sunday, Batman reference, you know. Um, just, just go with it. Uh, I love Batman, okay? I love um, Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. Some of you are right there with me. Some of you are judging me right now. Don't do that. Um, one of the themes that I love in those films is this whole question of what kind of hero do we need? What kind of hero do we need? And so in Gotham City, where Batman is this hero, along comes this other person. Who, does anyone know who this is? Harvey yeah, Harvey Dent. So Harvey Dent comes along, and he's like this white knight, kind of the quintessential white knight who shows up, and uh, he is ridding the city of its criminals, and he's very polished, very clean-cut, um, has this charismatic personality, and is just winning people over. And so the people of the city are like, yes, this is the hero that we want. Forget Batman. We want Harvey Dent. But if you know the story, Harvey Dent turns into one of the villains. He does not end up being the hero that they needed. And so after years away, Batman shows back up and saves the city, and he is the hero that Gotham City always needed. He is not the one that they wanted, but he's the hero that they needed. Now listen, one of the things we've got to realize about ourselves as fallen humans is we don't know what we need, do we? We, we don't know what we need. We think we do. We are so convinced that we know what we need. But just think back uh, over your life. Think about those things that you knew you needed. And maybe you even got them. And it turns out, whoa, I did not need that. Didn't even want that. And then on the flip side, think about the things that you didn't want. God gave them to you anyway, as he does. And it turned out to be exactly what you needed. I mean, our lives are full of those kind of things, aren't they? I feel like that's the whole story of my life, is God intervening and doing what I didn't want him to do, and it ended up being ideal, exactly what I needed. And that's, that's the kind of God that we have. We don't know what we need, but we have a God who knows exactly what we need and is willing to give it to us, thankfully. And so uh, as we think about Palm Sunday and we think about welcoming Jesus onto the scene, the question I have for us is, will we welcome Jesus on his terms? Will we welcome Jesus on his terms? Um, 
Let's look at verse 10 real quick. This is not the beginning of of the account. We'll go back and read it from the beginning uh, in just a minute. But look at verse 10. As Jesus is riding into town, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? That's the right question to ask, isn't it? Okay, who is this really? What does he really want to do? And uh, the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So they have some idea of who he is, and they have uh, some idea of who they want him to be and what they want him to do, as do we. We all have an idea of, oh yeah, this is what Jesus needs to do. This is who he needs to be for me. But the fact is, he was very different than that. The people here had this idea of who King Jesus was. He turned out to be, in their eyes, the wrong kind of king. He was wrong. He was wrong for the job. And we feel that way too. Sometimes, So what do we do with that when it seems like Jesus is the wrong kind of king and he's exercising his kingly authority in the wrong kind of ways? So I, according to these people, um, one of the first things that made Jesus the wrong kind of king was he made the wrong kind of entrance. He made the wrong kind of entrance. Uh, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he came humble, not powerful. Look what happened. Look in verse 2. As Jesus is getting ready to make his entrance, he tells his disciples, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This is, this is a king with kingly authority, isn't it? He knows exactly what's going to happen, and he's wielding that authority. But then verse 4 says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And this is the prophet Zechariah. You can go back and read it in Zechariah chapter 9. Saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble. Your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So when a king shows up to take over and take charge and make things happen, how does he arrive? On a horse. And here's Jesus showing up peacefully on a donkey. And I wonder if some of those people cheering were in the back of their minds wondering, wait a minute, why is he showing up with such humility? Um... Because, you know, we sometimes don't really admire humility. In fact, I I would ask us, what are the ways that we value overt power over humility? You know, in what ways do we want that white knight, that big personality? And we overlook humility. Humility. And here's the beautiful irony, okay? And, and, and we know this if we've been around church. It was actually the humility of Jesus that was his power. That was his power. Remember what uh, Philippians says when, when Paul's talking about how Jesus, even though he was one with his father, he, he is God, he is equal with God, but he emptied himself, became a human, and humbled himself humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. So he was humble all the way to the cross for us, and that is what conquered our enemy. His humility is what conquered. They wanted to conquer. Well, it was his humility that conquered. It conquered our sin. It paid for our sin. Thank God that he showed up with humility so that our sin would be taken care of. Uh, He showed up to die. And then he asks us, his followers, to die with him. That is not the king that they expected. That's not exactly the king and the rule that we want, but that's what he came to do. Die and ask us, take up our cross. Deny ourselves. Lose our lives for his sake. That's the kind of king that he is. He is humble. So he made the wrong kind of entrance, and then he brought the wrong kind of kingdom. 
from an earthly perspective, Jesus showed up bringing the wrong kind of kingdom. And, and the, the reason that it was wrong is because it was not an earthly kingdom, which is what was expected. It was a spiritual kingdom. Look at what happens in verse 8. Most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Um, we won't get into it, but all of these are symbolic acts of acknowledging Jesus is the king. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Um, this is a reference to Psalm 118. It's a psalm that would have been sung at the Passover season, which is when this was. It was a psalm that clearly pointed to Israel's future king. And Hosanna, uh, the, the term means save us. There's an urgency to it. Um, some scholars translate it save now, save us now, which could be a very urgent request. Or it could be, as Wayne has pointed out, a demand. God has invited us, graciously invited us, to come to him with all of our requests. He has not invited us to come with our demands, as though we are God. And he is not. Save us now, son of David. Son of David, because here's a descendant of David. That means... He's the king. So a descendant of David is going to come and sit on the throne. And so the expectation, it's very clear. Here comes somebody who's going to kick out our oppressors and sit on a physical throne and rule a physical kingdom. And Jesus didn't do that. He came with a spiritual kingdom. Now, um, let's just, just uh, make sure we understand. It's going to be a physical kingdom, right? That's coming. That is coming. There is going to be a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, and everything is going to be physically, earthly, exactly what it was always meant to be. That is going to happen. It's just it didn't happen as soon as we wanted. It hasn't happened yet. It's been 2,000 years now, and it still hasn't happened. But Jesus was going after the spiritual first. Um, we want the same thing that they wanted, don't we? We want Jesus to fix our earthly situation. We really do. We want comfort. We want our problems fixed. How could we not? That's what we want. But, you know, um, thank God. I, I've thought about this so many times. Thank God that he wants more for us than we even want for ourselves, doesn't he? He wants more for you than you even want for yourself. He, he's going after the root issues, the spiritual issues that you and I have. This was really driven home. And, and the more you read about what Jesus did, the more you understand he came to establish a spiritual kingdom first and foremost. I mean, he's going to, uh, in a couple chapters, he's going to tell these people to pay their taxes <laughs> to Caesar, which was like, wait a minute, pay our taxes to this pagan ruler who sets himself up as God instead of you? Yeah. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. In other words, my kingdom, it, it totally transcends what's going on down here. Um, and, and this was really driven home to me in a new way. Uh, I hadn't noticed this before, but just look at what happens next. Look at verse 12. Um, we've heard this story before. Uh, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers. Can you imagine this? And the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers just because of the extortion that was going on there. Now, um, a, a lot could be said about this, but just, just think about this one thing for a minute. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus makes his entrance as the king, he doesn't confront Herod. He doesn't march into um, Pontius Pilate, the governor. He doesn't go into Caesar's palace and confront Caesar. He could have done any of that. He's the king. He doesn't go to those places. Where does he go? He goes to the temple. 
That is interesting. In other words, he is addressing not the, the society or the government. He is addressing the worship first. That's very important, isn't it? And, uh, you know, I wonder, like, if Jesus showed up physically in our context, where would he go? And um, there's lots of places we would want him to go, lots of things we would want him to confront. Maybe we picture him going to um, the halls of power. Maybe he marches into Washington and um, demands that things be done correctly or takes over. Um, But maybe Jesus would come, in fact, is coming into our worship because he's addressing our spiritual issues first and foremost because that's where our problem is. You know, there's, there's all kinds of uh, things that we think are our problem out there. It's, it's in here that our real problem is, isn't it? It's right here. And that's what Jesus comes to address. I want to ask us, what are the earthly circumstances that we wish Jesus would change. We've got a list, don't we? I mean, we all have a list. And what if he isn't changing those things? What is he up to in the middle of our unfulfilled longings? Because he's there and he's doing something. What is that? And uh, I just want to say here that our longings are not wrong to have. Of course we have longings. We're in a fallen world. We're dealing with all kinds of stuff. Look at what happened this week. And, you know, I know many of you, and I I know um, the things that many of you are carrying right now. We have things that we long for Jesus to show up and address, things that are heavy, things that are painful, desires that are just so deep, and, and just these longings, we have them. And is, is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. It's not wrong to have those longings. But what do we do with them? Um, one of my favorite books is called Cupid is a Procrastinator. Has anyone ever read Cupid is a Procrastinator? Uh, by Kate Hurley. She is a musician and speaker. She's played and spoken here in our church, actually. Um, The subtitle of this book is Making Sense of the Unexpected Single Life. So it's a book about singleness, which is a very overlooked issue in church sometimes. Um, I love this book. I am not single, but I love this book because she writes so well about this, this issue of unfulfilled longings. All of us carry those. And listen to what she says uh, about this desire to be married. And think about your own longings uh, as you hear her words. She says, I can wait for that ghost ship forever. Or I can build a place where I can rest. A shelter that is heavy with hope, but tempered with acceptance. I love that idea. Heavy with hope, but tempered with acceptance. And then she says, it will probably never be easy. The longing may never go away, but perhaps God will teach me how to long and let go at the very same time. That's that's a profound idea, isn't it? How to long and let go at the very same time. Man, we need the Lord to, to teach us to do that because we do have longings. And yet, Jesus is not fulfilling all those longings right now. Um, You know, uh, just before we prayed together about what happened, um, Wayne read the words of Jesus in John 16, 33, famous verse. Um, I know many of us know it where, again, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. And I heard a pastor say, that's one of those promises we don't put on the fridge in this world, you have to, you know, you don't post that on your Instagram with like a landscape and the, the flowy script. In this world, you will have trouble. But he said we would. Because it's a fallen world. But then he said, take heart. Because I have overcome the world. And uh, let me just ask us, do we operate as though this world has overcome Jesus? 
I just think that's how we function. I just feel like that's how we get up in the morning sometimes. We get up and face the day as though the world has overcome Jesus. And maybe we're in despair about that. Or maybe we're scrambling around to kind of help Jesus get back in control or realign circumstances so that he's back on top. And like, we don't need to do that. He said, I've overcome the world. I have. It's as good as done. There's a process that I'm going through to fulfill that. But it is as good as done. But meanwhile, we have trouble in this earth. And, you know, that's why um, it's so important for us to remember uh, in Philippians 3 what Paul said. We're citizens of heaven. We are, the paperwork is already there. If we have put our faith in Christ and what he did for us, we are citizens of heaven. And in uh, Hebrews 13 says, here we have no lasting city, but we look to a city that is to come. Um, how much blood and sweat and tears have I spent trying to make a better lasting city for myself here? We have no lasting city here. We look to a city that is to come and it is coming, it is and so that's why uh, in Colossians, Paul says, let's fix our minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on this earth. The things on this earth, they're temporary. They're passing away. Well, someday every tear is going to be wiped away. Someday there'll be no more pain, no more struggle, no more annoyance. I'm reading between the lines there, but I think we won't be as irritated or frustrated. There won't be that futility that there is one. That is coming. We can cling to that because Jesus is establishing his kingdom. He is. And it is going to be earthly. But right now, he's already establishing his kingdom in a spiritual sense. And then uh, one more observation is that Jesus, here's another quote-unquote wrong way he was king, and that is that he recruited the wrong kind of people. <laughs> Jesus recruited the wrong kind of people. He's the wrong kind of king, and he's got the wrong kind of citizens in his kingdom because the people in his kingdom are the undeserving, not the so-called righteous people. Look what happens as he's in the temple in verse 14, it says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And, you know, um, we kind of race past that, like, yeah, Jesus healed. He would do that. Um, you know, there are uh, Jewish writings from this time that make it clear blind and lame were not supposed to be in the temple. If you had a handicap or a deformity of some kind, you were seen as unclean. It was also viewed as probably a result of sin. They weren't supposed to be here. And here they are. And Jesus is welcoming them. And he's healing them. And it gets worse because then there's disruptive children. Verse 15, but when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Um, this verse, I love this verse. When they saw the, did you hear it? When they saw the wonderful things he was doing, they were indignant. Wonderful, we find wonderful annoying is what they're saying. And you know what? We find wonderful annoying when it's disruptive, which wonderful often is. We're annoyed. You know, God comes into our life with these beautiful interruptions, and we notice the interruption part, but not the beautiful part. And we have, I mean, all of us have this, um, this sort of box of here's what God is like and here's the way he operates. And God just, he loves to just destroy those boxes, right? And he shows up with his glory and he just totally flattens that box. And, and like, we don't even see the glory. We're just like, ah, my box. That's what's going on here. We have a box of the way things are supposed to work. It's not working that way. And we're indignant 
And I said, do you hear what these are saying? You hear what the kids are saying? They're calling you son of David. Sounds like they think you're the Messiah. Jesus says, yes, have you never read? And then he quotes Psalm 8. Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. What they're saying is actually from God. They are calling me the Messiah, and I am the Messiah. You can't be the Messiah. Uh, why would you be running with the crowd that you're running with if you're the Messiah? But, you know, actually, um, this, this whole book is really, it's just packed with God choosing the wrong people, isn't it? Think about it. I mean, we could, we could spend hours just looking at the examples. God goes after the wrong people. Um, even just in this book, Matthew, um, countless examples. Actually, it, it was written by one of the wrong people. Matthew was a tax collector who became a follower of Jesus. And this book is full of examples of Jesus going after the wrong kind of people. How about back in chapter 5? We call that the Sermon on the Mount. And we call uh, that beginning section the Beatitudes, where Jesus says, blessed are who? The poor in spirit, the people who mourn, the people who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, meaning they're not righteous yet. The meek, the wrong kind of people, the, the wrong kind of people are the ones who are blessed and who have the kingdom. And then how about Matthew chapter 9? One of my favorite scenes of the life of Jesus. Here's Jesus at another party with another group of uh, crazy, outcast, irreligious, irreverent people. Jesus is right there eating with them. And then along come the church people. What are you doing eating with those people? And Jesus says, that's why I came. I'm here for them. I'm not here for you. I'm here for them. The sick need a physician. If you are convinced that you are healthy, go on your merry way. You, you don't think you need me. But if you recognize that you need me, come on. Come on, whoever you are. I'm here for you. I have not come to call the righteous. I have come to call sinners to myself. I've come for the wrong people. The wrong kind of people. Uh, how about Matthew chapter 18? The, here come those kids again. And you know what happened when kids were running up to Jesus. All the adults were like, don't bother him right now, you know? And Jesus said, no, no, no. I want to be with them. And actually, you had better be like them. Jesus even said, unless you change and become like these kids, you are not in my kingdom. Those are strong words, aren't they? Unless you change and become like one of these little children, you cannot be in the kingdom. Unless you recognize, I'm small. I am weak. I am dependent. You can't be in the kingdom. If you keep going here in Matthew 21, just look down the page at verse 31. Jesus says, to the religious leaders, the tax collectors, and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you because they believed the message and you didn't. So who's going into the kingdom? The wrong people. That's who. Um, you know, God, he loves to recruit the wrong people. He loves this. And I think every time Jesus was around the wrong kind of people and it really irritated the, the righteous people, I think Jesus secretly got a kick out of that, okay? I think he enjoyed ruffling feathers that way. Because we need, we need that disruption, don't we? Those of us who think we're righteous. Um, I love uh, how this is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul tells uh, this church, and I think he would say it to us, consider your calling, brothers and sisters, Think about who you are. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. You're nobody special, he's saying to this church. Thanks a lot, Paul. Well, you're not. But God, there's those two words again, right? But God 
chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. And I just think about how we scramble around and try to be wise in the world's eyes or strong or somebody in the world's eyes when God is already wanting us to recognize that we're nobodies. And that's exactly who he wants to use in profound ways in this world. And so let me ask us, how are we the wrong people? How are you, if you're honest with yourself, how are you the wrong kind of person for the kingdom of God? We won't enter the kingdom unless we recognize we're wrong for it. Unless we recognize we need help. And then, on top of that, who are the other wrong people in your world, in your neighborhood, at your work, in your circle, that God might be wanting to reach through you? Are there some wrong people in your circle? Is God going after them? Is God asking you to be an instrument to go and get those people? Um, and, you know, we won't be able to do that until we've acknowledged that we're one of those wrong people ourselves, will we? We won't be able to do that. Um, I want to put a picture up here to end. Can we get that last photo? So... Um, there's been some controversy lately about masks. Have you guys heard about this? <laughs> Do you know, I think masks are one of our biggest problems. I'm talking about spiritual masks is our biggest problem. I'm talking to us church people here. We put on a good show, don't we? We put on a good front. We, with one side of our mouth, we'll say we believe that all have sinned and everybody needs a savior. And then at the very same time, we'll act like we don't need that savior. I'm in good shape. I'm kind of on top of my game. I'm a moral person, way more moral than whoever else. And that is toxic. You know, we try to deceive people. We deceive ourselves. We even try to deceive God that we are the right people for the kingdom, and we are not. And we've got to come to grips with that. Jesus, we've just heard Jesus say, you can't even be in the kingdom until you recognize that you don't deserve it. And you recognize that you are sick and you need a physician. And you recognize that you're a little helpless kid and you need a good father to come and rescue you and bring you into his family. That's who we are. We've got to acknowledge that. And you know, the more we come to grips with that and acknowledge that, the more of that love of Christ will let in to our life and the more it will spill over to other people who are wrong people just like we are. Because our message to this world is not, look at us, church people, Christians, we are the right kind of people. That is not our message. Our message is, we need a savior. You need a savior. We have one. Let's band together and follow that savior together. That is the kind of king that he is. And so uh, let's look again at just these ways that Jesus was the wrong kind of king. And, and I want to ask, what if he'd been the right kind of king? You know, what if he'd come in on a horse? What if he'd kicked out the oppressors? What if he'd sat on a, a literal throne to rule an earthly kingdom with the kind of citizens that belong and that kind of, what if he had done that? we would still be in our sin. It would be an awesome kingdom that we could not be part of. Thank God he was the wrong kind of king. That is exactly the kind of king that we needed. Maybe not what we want, but what we need. So pray with me now. Um, God, we, 
we just acknowledge that sometimes the things that we want and the ways that we want you to be in our fallenness and, and in our weakness, uh, we don't even know what we need, God. And we just thank you, Lord, that you are a Lord and a King who knows exactly what to do for your people. And we thank you that you want more for us than we want even for ourselves. And that you're going after um, not just our circumstances, although you're going to solve all of those one day too, and we look forward to that, but you're, you're after so much more than just solving our circumstances. You are showing up to invade our, our hearts and minds. You are not just here to make us comfortable. You are here to make us great people, people like your son. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that and we open our hearts to that. And Lord, uh, on this Palm Sunday, we want to welcome you into our lives in a new way. And we want to welcome you on your terms as you are to do what you want to do, Jesus, acknowledging that that is best. It might be hard, it might be painful, but we accept it, Lord. Would you help us accept it and accept you as you are, Jesus, in your name, amen.